So our next speakers are from the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Um, and I'm going to let um, our first speaker introduce the others, um, just because I'm sure she'll have more of um, uh, information to say about each one since she's worked with them for a while. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Dr. Kim Edgar. She is currently the Education Superintendent at Adobe Mountain School at Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Dr. Edgar has over 25 years in the field of education. She has a long history of working with at-risk students, special education, and in the area of school discipline. She has served as an educator, special education educator, Dean of Special Education and Director of Deans working with at-risk students and special education students at the high school and the juvenile justice system. Additionally, she teaches online courses for the University of St. Francis in Juliet, Illinois and special education master's level coursework. So while we get started, um, I just wanted to say having the volunteers come in about a year ago, uh, I was approached by uh, Professor Wells and um, to bring in, to see if the ASU volunteers could come in. And I'm like, of course, why not? And it's been um, a great opportunity. It's been a great opportunity for our teachers. It's been a great experience for our teachers as well as the students coming in. Um, our first, actually Chandler was probably our first one that, was, that came into the Adobe Mountain uh, to to um, volunteer and he said, well, let's, let's talk with the teacher and see who we can get to you know, do the creative writing. We had a real good idea of who that individual was gonna be, but we um, kind of needed to talk to her. So we went in and we said, hey, you think you might wanna teach a creative writing class this semester? And she looked at us like, no. And we just kept, we talked through it, and, and it was just just so much out of her comfort zone. Um, but she she agreed to all right. I'll take I'll take that risk. And uh, Chandler came in, and they actually developed a curriculum. Uh, he taught, and when he was not there, she you know, picked up that uh, the rest of the teaching. And I have to tell you, it was probably one of the best uh, classes that we had with. Uh, the volunteers coming in and, and her moving out of her comfort zone and she absolutely fell in love with it. So it's been a great opportunity. It's been great growth for our teachers as well as for as the, the um, ASU volunteers. Um, again, I'm Kim Eager, uh, my principal, Mr. Frank Burns said, he's been, in, he's been involved in the detention education for quite a long time. I'm gonna pass the mic and he can kind of give a little bit of his background and we'll just pass it down. Okay, so it's a little loud. I'm loud, so I gotta kind of temper it down some. I've been in doing, um, working in corrections for the last 21 years. Um, I took a, I was actually released for a year and um, I was a principal at a charter. And then the opportunity to come back to uh, work with Adobe uh, came up, so I applied for the job, went back in. It's one of those things where I don't see myself teaching anywhere else. Um, or working anywhere else, teaching and also being a principal. I want to say to ASU and to uh, Dr. Wells, thank you for this type of program. I am an, a Sun Devil myself. Anybody uh, throw up your, throw them up, you know, if you got them, there we go. She went to U of A, so that's why. Um, <laughs> there are none. Okay, anyways. Um, but when I went to school and I went to the um, College of Education, we never talked about this type of population. It was how to work with kids who in kindergarten, and they're separated from their mommy and daddy. And then we get to prison, they're separated for years. That never came up, okay? The kids in kindergarten get to go back to mommy and daddy at the end of the day. The kids with me sometimes never get to see them again. And that was a harsh reality when I first started working in a juvenile facility, was that ASU didn't really prepare me for something like that. 
And there's more facilities out there that we don't talk about. There's residential treatment centers, the state hospital, juvenile facilities, state and county, private. Um, so it's a different niche, and I want to applaud everybody who's gotten involved in that, um, everybody who works in the industry. Um, it, it really is a passion for the people who get involved. So, and the, and the guys who came in from this panel, thank you very much for coming out and teaching. I think it's wonderful that you've um, had that passion to get in there and work with these, these people who are incarcerated. It's really good. Next person was Dr. Hall. We'll let him uh, speak a little bit. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Clayton Hall. Uh, I have been an educator for about 20 years. And I spent the preponderance of those years in and around the city of Detroit, um, teaching mostly at-risk youth. Uh, when I finished my graduate degree, I came out here and saw an opening at Adobe Mountain School and was really excited about teaching um, with that population. Um, I've been there about five years now, and I continue to enjoy it. I uh, feel like I grow as a person there every day that I'm there. The kinds of resilience and creativity that I see among the youth there continues to inspire me. Um, so I'm just really excited about my trajectory there and really excited also if I can just kind of uh, applaud our two administrators here. Um, they have only been with our agency for a couple of years uh, approximately and there have been some really positive changes going on there within education. Sometimes I feel like as educators, there's a whole lot of people from the outside of whatever your school is, district is, whatever, that will tell you what needs to be done on the inside. And sometimes those folks are invited in and that's fine. But very often the resources you need to change something and make something better already exist within the place that you work. And it, you just need to have leadership that kind of brings that out and lets those sort of things grow within organically. So we've had some changes going on um, structurally within the agency as it relates to education that have been really positive and I'm really looking forward to seeing that stuff continue. So um, I'm excited to be here. I didn't get a chance to work with the ASU um, interns or the ASU uh, tutors that were there with us. Um, a close friend and colleague of mine did so I was very excited to hear some of her stories with them coming in and I know that they produce some terrific work. So with that um, I'm going to pass it off to Ms. Lorson who is my colleague and friend. Good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Miss um, Karen Lorson. Um, I came to the agency about 14 years ago. I started in Scottsdale. I was the ELL um, instructor for Mountainside Middle School as well as Desert Mountain High School. And I felt like I needed a um, change. So being said, I went and interviewed and I got hired and my whole family was like, what are you doing? You're crazy. And um, I've been there for 14 years. I love my job. I wouldn't change it for the world. And um, um, I'm happy to be here. So, and I have to say, coming, it's been only about a year and a half, if, <laughs> but, um, the opportunity to come in and make changes has been, and and being able to do things that are going to help at-risk kids is just, it's been phenomenal. Um, but I do have to turn back to the teachers and the, the ones that work with these kids daily and, and really um, kind of loosening the control of the administration team and letting our, our teacher teams get involved and make some decision making and to, you know, bring in programming, working together. Uh, we, we'll talk about what um, Dr. Clayton Hall and, or Dr. Hall and uh, uh, Karen are doing um, as part of the transition process. So I don't want to jump ahead, but they really took that ball and ran with it. And we've got several other teachers that have just taken the ball, they're running with it, they feel like they've got the support. And I think that's, you know, the, the first thing we can do is give them the support to use their expertise to, to improve our programming. So our mind sh our shift is really to really look and and re it's really about creating hope and opportunity for our youth. I'm, so we wanted to talk about. You're going to need to do that. I'm kind of challenged with this anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, okay. So can I see mine? So um, I chose these two images for a reason. Um, it, it's clear when we're working in prison, a, a prison situation, we're working with incarcerated youth, the dialectic that we sort of feel like we are struggling with and challenged with is creating a sense of hope 
um, within a, an institution and a framework that often is so constraining, and we know the, histor like the historical background of it. We've heard a little bit about that today, and that historical background has elements that are really kind of, they make it challenging to create that sense of hope. So our dialectic for us is to try to find ways to push back against that a little bit, um, even though I encounter individuals daily at Adobe uh, as a large facility that are there with the best of intentions, we know that the institutions that we have created, these prisons, still can harm, even if it's unintentionally. So our goal is to try to rethink how we do things and to create that sense of hope within a framework where you wouldn't expect it. Every day when we walk in, we, we walk past the razor wire, through the metal detectors. Uh, when I visit youth on the unit to bring them paperwork or homework or an assignment or something they've done, I will occasionally talk with them through steel doors. And I remember the first experience I had with that, the two experiences that really came home to me in terms of what I was what I had moved into with, within teaching in, incarcerated, uh, in an incarcerated agency, what we had was uh, I would walk through an area and I, I saw the, the youth with their hands behind their back and when I went to the unit and saw that I had to talk to them through these steel doors, it really became a three-dimensional experience for me. So our goal is to try to create this sense of hope within that framework. And we understand that that's difficult, we understand that it's a challenge, we understand that there's a whole lot of uh, ways in which that kind of situation presses in the opposite direction. But that's our goal. Um, and so, just real quickly, we've gone through a lot, everyone's been sitting a lot, you can't be a teacher for 17 years and not be keenly aware of how long everyone has been sitting and listening to people talk. Um, so, just real quickly, for causal factors for our, our population at Adobe, um, economic distress and ACEs, um, we saw a really interesting and powerful presentation on uh, adverse childhood experiences. We know that this plays a huge factor in um, youth's um, at-risk status. Um, generational poverty, recession, recent recession that was very severe, and the effects on family and the household and the neighborhood, and the impact of those adverse childhood experiences, which lead to youth trauma, which make those same young people so much more likely to end up within the system. Um, if there's no force that kind of ameliorates or pushes in that other direction for them, it's easy for them to fall into those, those patterns. The school to prison pipeline, I won't say anything more about that. That's not, I'm not gonna go great detail because I know this audience already knows a lot about it, the harsh discipline policies, the disproportionate effects, et cetera. And then if you combine all that with the psychology of adolescence, right? So you have the factors of risk taking, age aspirational behavior, defiance of authority, that all just comes packaged with youth. So you take all those factors and this is the population that comes to us. And our job is to try to find some way for their experience within Adobe. You're incarcerated, you're locked up, you've been adjudicated. How can we meet you where you're at and still do something positive? Still try to help you find a way to be hopeful about your future in ways that you might not have thought you could be hopeful. So that's our challenge. And real quick data snapshot too of our youth, and then I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Eager again. Approximately 80% of our youth have uh, current or past substance abuse issues. Around 40% are identified as special education 504 and or ELL. Approximately 40% have documented, documented gang involvement, some of them very heavily entrenched and more than 50% of our youth have an identified mental health disorder with the majority of that number having a co-occurring disorder, right? So you have multiple things. There could be depression and something else that's documented in um, the DSM. So this is just a snapshot. So they come to us with these struggles, these challenges, and I remember walking through the gate the first time as, as an educator of 16 or 17 years in and around Detroit and trying to think about how I was gonna frame my experience at this place, right? We get into teaching because we think it's a helping profession. And the way that I framed it as I was walking through the razor wire for the first time was this concept that I learned in graduate school of the infected healer. Right, so we all come to this situation, if you want to teach, you want to help, but we come with our own pains, we come with our own traumas, we come with our own biases, etc. So how can we take all that, come into the classroom, still try to meet the youth where they're at, and still do something that's positive and create a sense of community within that classroom? My afternoon class has nine youth currently. We start the day every day with um, everyone seated so they can face each other, and we do a check-in, and we find out how people are doing. 
So, and by that we mean we check in specifically. I'm feeling good at a five, I'm frustrated. So I don't just let them say a number, I ask them to try to have the courage to share what's going on, right? So we take 15, 20 minutes sometimes before we even start class. So in terms of like the academic stuff, because if you don't have that sense of community, if you don't have that sense that they can be vulnerable in the classroom, if they don't see me be vulnerable as an educator, how can I expect them to? So when I ask them to write their first poem, I, I start by giving the poem that I wrote, which is the exact same assignment that they're doing, which asks them to dig into their past a little bit. So these are just some of the ways that I try to create that sense of me being vulnerable along with them. I haven't walked in their shoes. I am not, I, well, let me back up. I'm fairly certain that if I were to walk in their, their shoes, I don't even know if I would have been alive being able to sit and listen to someone like me speak, go through the goofy assignments and projects I asked them to go through. And they're still there and they struggle with that. And so I'm, I'm constantly inspired by that. So a quick aside there, we have, let's see here. This, um, I'm going to say real quickly, Dr. Eager, um, antipathy, the, the impact of all this is that we often encounter youth that have an antipathy or an apathy towards school, try to avoid challenges. They have a negative view of, of effort in some cases, right, because it involves vulnerability, it involves taking chances, I'm going to be judged, right, I might be seen to be not as smart as I think I am, or maybe don't think I am, threatened by the success of others, and they tend to give up easily. I see this every day. Right? So a huge portion of this is relational. When I finished up my graduate degree, my dissertation was in relation, the relational aspects and psychodynamics of schooling. I looked at small experiences that young people have in combination with an adult that was caring and how those small experiences transformed their perception of who they were as a learner. And, those, and that's how I came to that because I had that experience. I had somebody who cared enough about me as a student to see past the academics, see I was a person, and give me some supports that I needed. And it totally transformed my approach to learning, completely transformed me as an individual. So um, perceived constrained options for the future, so they don't see a lot of options that may be open to them, and have a constrained sense of efficacy of the things they're able to do or may be able to do within a few weeks, months, or years. So. Our job, and it's cut off there at the bottom, as we see it, is to kind of help empower them in whatever ways we can in the short time we have them and try to help shift their mindset, which also involves um, shifting our mindset. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. So we have a facility-wide focus and an individual education focus that Dr. Eager is going to speak to. So we, we provide, Adobe has the treatment side. Uh, we're seeing a high amount of uh, youth individuals needing, you know, the clinical treatment. Uh, we see kids that um, have not been in school since fifth grade, you know, or they missed the really significant um, learning opportunities and, you know, to have just had failure their whole, whole life and, um, and so school just was never a good place for them. Uh, even coming from the traditional school, working with the at risk, the high risk kids, school just was not the place where they felt comfortable. And it, it's very important to make, to help these kids kind of shift that mindset and, and look and see that there's opportunities out there. But again, it comes back to building those relationships with the kids and um, providing programming that's, that's you know, gonna, is, fits their needs. Um, oftentimes in education, we're making the kids fit our system, our needs of our system, and how the, the traditional school is structured. So when, we came in, when I came into Adobe, it was just an opportunity to really start looking at that personalized learning. What do these kids need? Where are they at? Uh, you know, some of them are at you know, second grade level, not even identified as you know, special needs. Or, um, so part of that is getting those holes plugged up so that they can be successful and, and, and really find that success. And, and you know, we've, we, this year, we've brought in a couple different programs. Um, where they're gonna, we're plugging the holes. They're gonna only they're, they work on skill sets that they need specifically to them, and then also we still provide the core education and we still provide the the classes that they need. Um, so and 
so we've been really looking at you know our, our classroom community. How do we how do we bring it? It's and it's tough. And it, listening to the volunteers talk about, I'm glad to hear that Adobe is does have a lot more. Um, Resources. Assistive technology or, and uh, you know our classrooms and providing them with a lot more resources, but um, and, and it's it's unfortunate because these are the kids that really need the resources. They need much more resources than uh, the minimal, and um, so my, our focus is to really provide them, you know, with the ability to, you know, with technology. When they're leaving, they need to be able to navigate through technology and. Um, when I came in, it was like, oh no, we, we can't have iPads. I'm like, well, why not? You know, <laughs> if we can lock them up, why not? And, you know, because, the, it, and learning is really moving towards through their phones and iPads. And so we need to prepare them as, you know, when they, when they leave us. Um, so differ, differentiated instruction, whole class learning, um, you know, universal design, really let, allowing kids to uh, demonstrate mastery through different representations and um, the ability, to, you know, we, we've got kids that can't write and then, but we grade them on the, their writing assignment. Well, what if they could express to us that they understand and master the content through verbalization? So just looking at different ways, shifting our, 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 the ways that we're doing things so that we are meeting their needs. And Frank, I think you might be up. Okay. Okay, so specific strategies and interventions that we do with the kids. Mm -hmm. All right, so whenever a kid comes into Adobe Mountain, uh, we send them through what we call Rack School. It's an assessment um, portion, about three weeks they're gonna be in this um, class and also in this certain unit. And what we're gonna do is do a bunch of assessments, not just educational assessments, but also treatment assessments, some risk assessments, um, to find out what's the best treatment for the kid, also what's the, what classes they need to be in. We're, at, during this time, we're looking for records. Um, what we have found is that we're starting to look at their elementary records. Before we came, before we came there, they were just ordering records from the detention centers around the, from the county they were at, maybe a couple of the high schools. We really had to start going back all the way to elementary because we started finding that that's when the testing was done, and all of a sudden this kid got up and moved somewhere else. They moved to another state. They moved across the town. Uh, somebody else didn't pick up, didn't send the paperwork. Um, so there's some missing pieces there. So we're trying to fill in the gaps and we're going as far as back as we can. The CAPFA uh, is just a system where we're starting to get their information and build a portfolio for that kid of how we're going to be able to help them. Personalized learning plans, PLP is what we're calling them. We're actually digitizing this, um, and we're going to, in the very near future, make it available to the whole facility. So real time, they can see what their grades are, how many credits they have, um, what their PBIS um, rating is right now, um, the whole child. So anybody on that facility can look at, look at it and go, where are you at right now with us? What phase are you in? How close are you getting out? How far back are you from getting out? What happened to you? What'd you do? Um, so that's what we're moving towards. MTSS, this is something very new that Dr. Eager um, started, was that while they're in this rack process, the week before they go into the regular classes, we sit down and we look at the kid and what their needs are. And then we say what classes they need assigned, if there's a mentor on, on campus that will work well with them. Um, if this is a kid who on their tape scores got first grade, but then we look at their AZ merit and they're approaching, you're like, okay, where's the disconnect there? Or vice versa. And we're like, okay, what's going on with this kid? Do we need to get more assessments on him uh, or her? Um, do we need to look back further with some of their um, records and see if they've ever been identified with SPED or um, ELL? And then tiered interventions for struggling youth. We're bringing in what we're doing. We're changing our school schedule a little bit so we do more intervention during the day. Um, we do two classes. Let me say. Let me talk a little bit about our structure of our day. We do two classes um, at Adobe Mountain for about a two and a half hour block, and one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Then I go to lunch. We're going to be changing to where um, we're inter intertwining PE 
within the school day more. And then um, it's going to be like a four-hour block, but they're going to take a break and get physical movement, then come back. So we think that will help, and then it's going to be more of like Monday and Wednesday or period one, Tuesday, Friday. So we're going to do something a little bit different because we're not getting the best results, we think, right now. So let's try it and see what happens. Plus, it gives us opportunity to do more interventions because most of these kids are coming two to three grade levels behind to us. And then the ASU students. And also we have Grand Canyon University. I don't want to leave them out. We have Grand Canyon University students who come at night and two kids who are interested in getting their GED. Uh, we revamped our GED program. I kind of took some of the things that we did over county um, to the state level and started doing those, and we've seen a lot of good success already. So we do have two um, students that do come in. Uh, Chandler that we got to here, I don't know if he's still here or not. He did a wonderful job. The guy was great. I didn't hear anything, but it, it was wonderful. The kids loved him too. They kept on asking when he's gonna be coming back. And for kids who really don't connect with people, all of a sudden this guy comes in once a week and they're asking where's he at? It's a big thing, it really is. Someone's calling, oh well. Um, <clears throat> recognizing that fair doesn't mean equal. Uh, there's a famous quote from uh, Jimmy Johnson, who's coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and he said, hey, listen, I'll treat you fair, but it doesn't mean I'm going to treat you all the same. The star quarterback's going to get a little bit better, um, better dealings than the guy who's third string. So this quality, equality and equity kind of tells you that. Let me just tap. Yeah. So... Typically in schools, it's across the board. Every kid's got to get every, you know, we've got to treat every kid the same way. We can't give some other, one kid something and another kid something else. And we really have to shift away from that because it's not about equal across the board. I'm popping back to the other. Um, and it's, it's, the vision is to ensure that every kid at Adobe gets what they need. They get, even if they need that extra help, they get the pullouts. The uh, school-wide interventions and the, the MTSS, if we need to go to the next tier, is just ensuring that they're gonna have success um, when, they're, when they're at Adobe and hopefully that success will transfer on when they, when they leave. But it's, um, it's important, you know, through our process, we're really implementing um, various programming so that we really, really are getting down to the nitty gritty and the diagnostics. Um, previously, we were basing a lot just on tape scores and, and what they can do. And, and we're finding our kids, when we have them here, you know, they don't, it's interesting because as a dean, Working on the other side of the fence, are, you know that you're working with kids that are under substance abuse and having you know problems in the traditional school and getting suspended and missing school, and it's when they come over to us, it's like, oh, we have them. Let's let's do something with them because you know they they are they're not under the influence. They're they're coming to school every day. They're getting support um, through the clinical treatment side, and and you know it's really that piece of time where we can really capture them and, and do really good work and, and hopefully get them to the next level in, in their transition. And so part of uh, what we have brought in is the transition programming. A lot of our transition, you know, that would be beyond just a, a couple courses, which uh, our transition team will address, was really the outside community transition people were working with our youth and we weren't doing a lot on the inside and we weren't connected with various uh, community organizations and so it was a very big disconnect and so our goal was to do the direct connect. How do we get these kids the direct connect so when they leave us their next step is into a career or college or something, apprenticeship. So that's really been our focus and the team over here has just really taken it and I'm gonna let them go ahead and explain it, but they've done a phenomenal job with it. Um, all right, so just real quickly, there's a couple agency-wide things we wanna we'll kind of breeze through. Um, 
obviously there's community correction, so once the youth transition out, the idea is that they're still receiving support um, from a couple of different like branches or domains that are still connected to our agency. They work with transition coordinators um, that work with individual youth to try to help them as they transition back out into the community. We all know this is like a bumpy and imperfect process and there's a whole bunch of variables that go into the success of that or, or fail, like not the non-success of that, but um, these are the efforts that are made kind of at the agency level. But within education, we've also begun to focus a lot more on how we help the youth be prepared to be as successful as possible and to see as many opportunities as possible for themselves when they leave. So uh, Ms. Lorson actually was the person who first taught the VOC 256 class, which is a um, kind of school to career or school to work um, class. And we've built on that with an advanced course, which we now team teach, which we're both very excited about, um, which we'll talk about um, briefly in a second. Um, do you wanna say a few yeah. things about school to work real quickly? So Probably about 10 years ago, um, I was fortunate to be on the ground floor and um, start this program, School to Work, um, using the Merging Two Worlds curriculum with Heather Griller-Clark, Dr. Heather Griller-Clark, who's in our audience today, um, and take it from the very bottom and build it up to what it is today. Um, so some of the stuff that we did in that class was we started off with, who am I, where am I going, how am I going to get there, and how do I keep it all together, which builds community and treatment and things about themselves all into one big picture. Um, in that class, we've done everything from resume writing to um, job applications to having them investigate careers on AZCIS, mock interviewing. Um, my, our class also was involved in doing um, community service with um, Phoenix Children's Hospital where they made books actually every Christmas and, and donated them. And from there, the class has evolved into a bigger picture now. So um, we are now doing the um, career readiness class, which is VOC 361, which has added a ton of community partners plus a lot more advanced levels of school to work. And I'll let Clayton talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and it's really, it's just an extension of her original class. One of the neat components that's kind of the central component of this new class is the ACRC, the Arizona Career Readiness Credential. Um, we've worked in partnership with um, uh, Mr. Ridgely, and it's, it's AZ at work. Arizona at work. Thank you. So our partnership with them has led to us being able to test the youth with um, in four different domains so that when they leave our facility, they get something called the Arizona Career Readiness Credential. The cool part about this, and I understand that even the phrase school to work has a problematic history, but the, the neat thing about this is the group that has spearheaded this has gone out to all kinds of employers in the state and asked them, what kinds of things are you not seeing in candidates that are coming to you? Potential candidates to work at your facility, at your company, whatever. They then took those questions, the answers to those questions, and built around that a curriculum and also a, an assessment that helps test young people, and not just youth, but also people in their 20s and 30s, helps build up some of the skills among them, the soft skills, communication, team, team building, and, te and team rapport, things like that, that they're really, really crucial to the actual employers in the state. And then be able to get those folks to be on board with a little bit of curriculum and pass this, this credential or this exam. Once they're done, they get the ACRC credential. They leave our facility with a packet of stuff that Ms. Lorson is wonderful putting together, um, information, contacts that they can uh, use to try to reach people on the outs so that they can actually increase their chances of getting a job. And the ACRC credential, which they can earn at the bronze, silver, gold, or platinum level, they then staple to their resume or bring with them when they go to a job interview. And it identifies them as somebody who has these qualities, these characteristics, these dispositions, these academic skills. So we are in our second term of that class right now. Correct. Our first uh, class all earned the credential at varying levels, most of them silver or gold. Um, and We had 22 um, credentials come out of that class last semester, so it was awesome. And we were really excited about it, and the youth were beaming, right, because we worked all semester to try to build them up so that they could get this credential, and when we finally finished all four parts of the test, and again, these are youth that very often have encountered school in a negative light, they were just kind of just immensely proud of the fact that they had earned it. And we think 
and I believe as well, that this is a real practical thing, something that they can, it's tangible, something they take with them. It doesn't guarantee that they'll get the job, but if there's 30 possible employees and one of them has a certificate and the other ones don't, the employers are on board with looking at this credential as something that will give them a leg up in the interview process. So we're really excited about it for that reason. Um, and it just really attaches real practical things to um, what they experience in school. And the school to community partnerships, Ms. I'll let Ms. Lorson speak um, on. She's been doing it. Yes, yeah, so we have the Arizona Apprenticeship Program that comes in, and um, one of our students last term actually was on the um, interviewing factor of getting a job with one of the apprenticeship companies. So I, I can't tell you if he actually did it, but they had his name and they were actually gonna um, hire him. So they mean, they mean what they say and they're here for every single one of our youth, which is amazing. Um, again, the ACRC credential that they're getting. Um, Let's see, we have um, Retail Arizona coming in who's actually trying to get them jobs within different retail places. We also have uh, a call center training that's coming in and they're willing to sit there and train the kids on um, how to get jobs, you know, um, doing a call center. Um, and Arizona at Work, Regina Weiler has been ter tremendously... Um, just given a ton of her time to work with every single one of our kids and they pick up, um, they come in every Friday with different uh, speakers for us and so the kids get to learn a little bit of e from every, every group they co that comes. And we're really big on trying to transform dispositions in the class. So when, when the class starts, when they come through the door as a unit, the whole unit comes to us. And the unit that we work with is a, a high-risk drug unit. And they come in and we greet them at the door. It's handshakes, it's eye contact. So we, we try to start building up some of those dispositions at the very beginning of the course and we work on that throughout. So whether it's the job interviewing, the mock interviews, or anything. So we're just trying to empower them as much as we can and give them as many tools that they can put in their tool belt as possible. Um, and both of us, everybody that works there is keenly aware of what the institution is and where we work, but that's the lay of the land, right? Our job when we're there is to do what we can to help empower these young people to maybe see themselves differently. This happened to me when I was 16 because of one person. One person gave me some assistance, some care when I needed it, and it completely transformed my approach to education. I was getting disconnected from it. I was starting to shut down. The whole learned helplessness thing was, was happening to me in pretty severe levels. And that one person's reaching out made all the difference in that one moment. So pretty much everything I've done in education past that point has grown out of that and we just think it's a neat opportunity to work as a team in the class to make some of that some of those opportunities flourish for them as well do you want to add anything else um, no, I'm good. okay dr. eager so I have to say they started this class two weeks two weeks uh, or two blocks ago and it's been the most amazing transformation to see these kids interact with each other they're not remaining in their seat and you know we there's movement there's interaction there's a lot of uh, collaboration with the kids and it's and it's really phenomenal to see that kind of um, interaction and and that growth with them and it's 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 pretty amazing to watch they've done a great job um, so again does anyone have any questions um, no. The other thing, the other thing, uh, we had ASU Project Rise up there. That's a group with um, Heather Griller Clark. Um, they come in and do mock interviews with the kids. Also, if they're turning 18, they help them try to get into college, tech trade school, um, give them resources so they're successful. Because the one thing is, us being juvenile, once the kid turns 18 and they're released, we're done with them. Okay. Only about 48, 49.8% of the kids ever make it to adult. So now you have a little over 50% who go out in the world, they don't have that, some of those resources. So Project Rise have done, IT has done a really good job of kind of filling that void for some of our youth. So just wanted to say that. And I believe they're also working on a um, STEM program that they're going to be bringing into this transition class. So that's going to be another exciting uh, opportunity for our kids to work with um, 
uh, people that are in those areas and, and they're gonna come and talk to the youth and it's just starting. So it's, that's gonna be another dimension to that that, again, exposes, gives kids more um, opportunities to look at. Well, I will say that across the nation, there's some statistics that just 2017, the um, facilities that have over 100 beds, have uh, the population has gone down 74%. I worked over at Ceph, which is in Mesa, for 18 years. We were at about 160, 80 kids. Now that facility is at 60, sometimes the highest is 80. Dobie Mountain was at 300, 400 not too long ago. But within about five years, they had black, they had um, black cane, right? I always call it black adobe because I just put the two together. Um, black cane was the girls site, and there was over 100 girls. Right now, we have 11 girls. So the, the population has dropped. I would say that looking at statistics statewide, about 2,000 kids get into county facilities. We serve about 200 of those kids. So about 10% come to us. Um, I don't have anything about recidivism rates or anything like that right now, except for in a three-year span, there was just a study that we got, was that kids who came out, who became 18, only less than 50% of them got into adult. So I would like to see us try to bring that down in the next three years. That would be our goal. Well, that's that's from uh, uh, having a felony um, in the state. There's some things that politically have changed. I would say that the, we used to get a lot more kids, but the Casey Foundation, who started back in the 2000s and looking at low-risk and high-risk offenders, um, that made a big impact across the nation. You saw facilities start going down in their population because, and I've seen it firsthand, where you had kids who were going into facilities to recruit other kids. Um, prostitution, um, uh, gangs. I mean, you would have kids who were just involved. And, and Gabriel's, you know, look, he's like, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. It's it's the networking thing. And like, I I told the story to all the people there that I work with. We had a young lady who used to get just little things every couple months, come and recruit for a pimp. And she would talk about the lifestyle and everything. She would get out. They would contact her and they would get involved. So it, it's, it, the nice thing is that you're starting to see more of those low-risk offenders not coming in, and we're trying different um, DAP programs, detention alternative programs in the community. I think that's great. Now, the rise has been mental health. We've got a lot more kids used to go to state hospital, but there is no state hospital to go to. So we've had a change in detention of how we're giving services. Treatment has had to go up. When I first started detention, there was no treatment for the kids. And then all of a sudden, it started slowly coming in with them hiring a couple psychologists here and there, counselors. And now we have a full um, department for it. So to me, it's that's a very important is that, because as an educator, I used to argue, well, if I get their education, they'll be better off. And then a treatment person's like, well, you got to solve some of their problems so they can use that education. We need to work together. So we're both right when it comes down to it. Yes? You know, the STEM, that's just coming off the ground. We do have a large CTE program. Um, so the tech trade stuff is there. Um, we have a culinary class, a cosmetology class, a um, automotive, a, a, a residential wiring. They're all giving, feeding it to me. Um, we really, we started this one cool thing. It's called virtual reality welding. We have virtual reality, reality um, welding machines. So that's coming up. We just started that. The STEM that we're going to start with the ASU is just getting off the ground. So don't have too much of it right now. Would you like to say and more about that? And we also, this block, um, 
providing or they're taking uh, parenting classes. So that's that, and they are Frank. You can talk because you're you know more about it. But they are really into it, and it's 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 really going well. So you, it's not really a STEM, but you look at the science of just taking care of a kid and the um, opportunity because we we're trying to break the cycle of what's going on. I can say that just the other day we had a junior come in. His dad was there so many years ago, and now the junior is there with us. Everybody was like, wait a second, I know that name. Well, yeah, because I'm the junior. So we're, we're trying to break that cycle, and this parenting class that we started up um, has gotten a lot of rave reviews by the staff. Not just education staff, but the staff. And let me say this, if you, uh, the, the only, you're only gonna have a successful program if you have a really good working with your security in a juvenile detention center. The security, we don't, we're not, we haven't really talked about them today, but if they're not there to support you and support your program, you're gonna be doomed. It really is. I mean, I've worked with people who, who security guards have said, why are we doing education? These kids don't go to school when they're on the outs. And it's like, well, we're trying to help them, try to give them a new path. So then they want to go back to school. So they can see, maybe they're not going to school, but they'll go to tech trade school to do something else. And they'll see, like, become a lifelong learner. All right? So kind of, kind of give them that new hope. Um, I worked in San Diego, and my big thing was that um, if they weren't doing state they were 18, what about the ones that get out, you have to go back to the home environment. That would be a catalyst. I, th I think, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that's where we're looking at that direct connect. When, if we can get the kids to transition, we have them set up so that they're going right into a, a something that's gonna keep them occupied. Um, but the, the, the reality is you can't change, I mean, you, we're not gonna change the environment. We just have to change the opportunities for the kids and create that direct connect I mean, there are programs out there with Job Corps where they could go and stay at a dorm. Um, but for, for us, it's if, if they have a clear path and we have our outside transition coordinators knowing their path, and, and that's um, basically our goal is to try to really lock that connection to, the, to their a career opportunity or education. And that's, that's actually, um, I've had a little bit of experience in both uh, silos, both the education silo and then just wrapped up a master's in uh, of science and professional counseling. So I was also there as an intern, so uh, as, a, as a basically a counseling intern. So I then got to see a little bit um, from the treatment perspective side, going into the units, sitting in with group treatment, working with individual youth and counseling individual youth um, as they tried to move through the, the stages or what we now call phases of their kind of advancement at Adobe. So basically those, those things are related to education, how well they do in treatment, and they have to kind of tie these things together and their behavior, and they tie these things together to try to get a big picture of the youth's improving, you know, getting additional skills, coping mechanisms. I have to be honest with you, and I know that there's a little bit of, when I first walked into this institution, I walked in with a whole bunch of perceptions about what it was going to be like. Um, I certainly don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it, it's a prison, right? And we all know that that comes with a whole bunch of baggage. But I have to say that then, so five years ago, um, in the mid part of my, my tenure there, and even now, I'm still very impressed with the focus that they have as an agency on rapport building, on the psychological side of how we relate to these young people, as opposed to just finding new submission holds when they start to act up, right? So there, there needs to be a component that is really rooted in understanding these youth and where they're coming from and how you de-escalate situations so that you don't have to use force. When I gave the example of the infected healer, I remember when I was teaching, I think with you, a fight broke out in class, right? And I was closer to the kid that was getting beat up than security was. I ended up 
on top of that kid using one of the primary restraint techniques that we had learned and with his arms behind him like this and he was leaking, he was bleeding on the floor and I'm thinking to myself, post this event, right, I just became like, like the, the person who's using force, the power in that classroom. I now have to sit down with these same youth and try to project you know, a completely different side as an educator, right? So it's a complicated, complicated situation. Um, and I just, I think that there are things that are being done I'm not gonna lie, I know for a fact, I've seen youth leave and come back two weeks later. They parole, they PV, they abscond, whatever. It happens, um, it happens frequently. There's so many variables outside the fence of our facility. Some of our youth will self-sabotage so that they don't have to go back into those same communities. And they'll, they will screw things up at their stage four or phase four just so that they go back to stage one and stay with us, which says everything about how we treat young people and, how, and our communities in terms of them being disadvantaged and ravaged by recession and, and you know, we can go into the whole litany of problems that we have in the wealthiest country in the world, but it's just something that I think for our job is to try to, again, push back against that as much as we possibly can in the short time we have them. Um, I'm really impressed with a lot of our youth coming to our class and they talk about the coping skills they're learning and then we ask them, you know, what, so what like, are the two or three skills that you've been using that work for you? Because when you're on the outs and somebody gets in your face about something, right, your first instinct is gonna be to close your fists, right? We need to have some alternates for you. And I don't know, it's messy. I've been in education for 20 years the answers are always messy. So um, I don't know if I really helped at all, but um, and, that's my take on it. I just want to tap, just hang on for a second. I mean, even our kitchen or our, our food that we serve and um, is all fresh made. It's not institutional food. It's, you know, and they work with the kids to say, hey, is this working? Is this not working? We've got a great, culin or the culinary staff um, or kitchen staff that really, it's important to them to, you know, they're gonna be here, they want them to have fresh, good food because then that's gonna help them be healthy and, and um, those, the other things that come with good eating and not eating that institutionalized food. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely. And I'm trying to, my question is, what would I need to do to be able to go into Adobe Mountain to be able to speak to you? How about, we can talk um, after, and then we got another question over here, and then we can, when we're done, we can speak, talk with you. Okay. Actually. We have one more question, or no? Is, is it fast? <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, there's actually some by parole. Parole handles that, and we have gotten some numbers back from them. Um, we do have what's called absolute discharge, and 90 days after the key gets out, they're meeting all the requirements. They are let off parole. Um, <clears throat> so we do get records of that. I don't have those numbers on top of, uh, with me right now, but we do have some, and I think they are public access, so if you wanted to find out, um, you, you, we can you can look those up, um, but they, I think it goes back to that question over there that she had was that we put them back in the same situation. It is very hard. What's the answer? We're still looking forward to. So we do collect data three years for the recidivism. We go out about three years. I can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah. I, 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 I yeah. plus we're getting a hook. We're so, good. Uh, <laughs> Time to go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.